we can start. So thank you guys more for coming. Like this is our last meetup before the summer. So hopefully you all of you will enjoy it. We did registration. Now I got my opening. Then I would like to welcome Victor and our like our third speaker here. So I would like really thank. He was really great, and the like crochet cruise with him was really amazing. You can ask him questions during his presentation. Uh, yeah, and we want to make it this more interactive. And after that, like you're gonna have prepared like food and beer over there, so you can enjoy that. That doesn't work actually. So like manually, please ask him questions manually. Uh, why we do this? Like we do this because our we have reactive conf. This is part of reactive universe. Also meetups and our conference. This year we moved it to Prague. So hopefully I will see there many of you. For those who want to come, uh, thanks to our partner, I can offer like 15% discount. It's gonna be mentioned once again. So don't worry and you you can get those tickets cheaper so to read about us like us and hopefully you will enjoy it and now i would like to give our partner like five, a few seconds to present himself. so hello everybody i'm really excited to see everybody of you today uh, my name is artem i'm a full stack developer here in actum and as you may already know actum brings digital transformations to clients all over the globe by using really cool technologies like react react native and angular and today we are excited to hear and learn more about closure script so uh, we really thankful for our friends from vacuum labs to making this event happen and we're thankful to you for coming today and we making it by giving you 15% discount for upcoming Reactive Conf this year in Prague. So also, we are inviting you to some snacks and quality networking afterwards, so don't forget that. And enjoy the talk. See you then. OK, so in meanwhile, let, like Victor will, I, I will get it off. You, so. Yeah. so for the for the one that's gonna ask like the best question or more interesting question, we got prepared T-shirt. So like you can wait. It's limited. We can sign it. <laughs> well, I guess Victor, not me. But yeah. So I would look like I would really want this. So I, <laughs> I, I, well, I got it. But here's my fourth question. You will ask. Well, it's strong, I guess. What? Thank you very much for having me. Um, sorry for speaking English. I hope that's okay. Uh, so yeah, I'll talk a little about the Closure Script, uh, the very functional and dynamic programming language, and you can, how you can apply it in the browser. First, a little check: how many people have heard of Closure Script before? Good. How many people have programmed Closure Script? <laughs> Good. Per then this talk is on a perfect level. Um, so, first a little about me. Uh, my name is Victor Eriksson. I'm the CTO at Piloxa. We're a medtech startup from Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, we are using a, we have, yeah, we help people take their medication in time with a mobile app and a smart pill box. And I've been working professionally with Clojure Script for the past five years, more or less, and also a lot of JavaScript. And when I'm not programming, I'm, I also enjoy surfing, hiking, and sailing. Um, so, the, the agenda for today. Uh, first, I'll talk a little about what Closure Script is. And to understand that, I'll give a little tour of Lisp, because uh, Closure is, Closure Script is a Lisp dialect. Uh, then I'll do some live coding uh, to show you how it, how it works. And then I'll talk a little about how you can get started with Closure Script, either at your company, the small project, or like a hobby project. And then ultimately, I'll compare Closure Script to JavaScript. Previously, there's been a lot of other questions like comparing Closure Script to other languages. So I'll happily do that uh, if I like, depend on how familiar I'm with them. So, um, what is Closure Script? Closure Script is a dynamic and functional programming language that compiles to JavaScript. It's a variant of Closure, but Closure runs on the JVM. Um, and it's a Lisp dialect. 
Sometimes I will say closure when I actually mean closure script and vice versa. No, not vice versa, but yeah, I'll use closure sometimes like indistinguishably. It's because they're so close and the syntax is so similar that I kind of view it as, as the same thing. They just compile to different targets. Um, so, Lisp. Uh, I don't know, maybe you've done Lisp in school, maybe not. It doesn't matter because it's very, very simple. Very confusing at first look, but actually very simple. Uh, it's just lists that evaluate to values. And the, uh, the syntax, or like the yeah, list, what it stands for is list processing. So everything is based on lists. And the first element in the list is the function, and the rest of the elements are the arguments to that function. Uh, very simple. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of code. Uh, so for example, in this case, we have the function plus, and the arguments one and one, and they return two. So like by, by including this in a list, it means that you will evaluate this as a function with these arguments. Works the same way for subtraction. The function minus takes multiple arguments. Three and one, you get two. The function plus actually takes multiple arguments. So you can add multiple arguments together in this list. And you notice that there are no commas there. You can use commas if you like commas. Oh, wait. Is this? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, but you don't have to use commas since it's a compiled language. Yeah, doesn't, there's no need for it. And there's also a function called, so here's another example of a function. Print ln will print to the console the string hello world. Um, yeah, so it's not, not too complicated. And also, as I said before, lists evaluate to values, just like in mathematics, from the inside out. Uh, you, you start with it like the, in the inside and then you go outwards. So first you have this expression that evaluates to three, right? And then the rest, the whole thing evaluates, evaluates to four. Uh, so that is the, like the basic syntax of Lisp. Uh, so now, actual closure script. Um, so closure, first I'll go through a little about like the basics of closure script. It's a functional and dynamic paradigm. One feature with closure script is immutability that is uh, very, very like important and embraced. Uh, I'll talk a little about that. Then, uh, not all the code, not all the code is closure script. So sometimes you'll have to interact with JavaScript. So I'll talk a little about how that can be done. Then I'll talk a little about data validation, and then ultimately I'll talk about a little about the the REPL. Uh, if you've done Python, for example, you might know what the REPL is. Uh, and we also use that frequently in ClojureScript. So, the basics. Uh, defining vars and function. So a var, like a variable, is defined using the function def. So we define the symbol a to be 1. So then, that uh, var can then be used in the following expression. Plus 1, a1. Uh, so that is two. Um, nothing super strange there. Uh, then about functions, you, you define functions using defin. In this case, um, the, fir the, the first element or the second element is the symbol, that the function, the function name. And then the third, and here you see, uh oh, this is a vector. This is not a list anymore. So closure, closure script, one philosophy behind closure and closure script is that it's be to be pragmatic. So it's taken a lot from Lisp, but one thing that some Lispers don't like is that it actually has a lot of other data structures. For example, vectors here. Uh, and in this case, the vector is used for the arguments to the function. And then the last value in the, the, the element of the list is the actual function and what it will return. And this, in this case, we have arg and we add one to it. And closure functions always return values. So it's a functional program language. It'll always return a value. And in this case, uh, this error means that it re what it returns. So we can use our new add1 function with 2 as an element. We get 3 back. And 
a little word like functional programming lingo, uh, pure functions uh, means that a function only depends on its input arguments and it doesn't touch anything else in the outside world and just returns a value. And this is very common in Clojure Script. Almost all functions are like that. They only depend on the input values and they only return a value. So they're not referencing the outside world. They don't know what context they're being called in generally. They just, you can just have them in any file and they do the same thing, um, typically. Um, so here, but you can do, so this is pure functions. And if you're super strict about functional programming, for example, Haskell, then you, it's very hard to do side effects. Or it's, but as I said before, Clojure strives to be pragmatic. So bring a lot of the smart things from functional programming, but also like, like do things easier for you. Um, so you can do side effects, as they're called, which means to write to a database, do an HTTP call, like things that are not just returning a value. Uh, so in this case, you, can, you have a new function called add1, and they add little exclamation mark, like exclamation marks and question marks, unless in other languages, unlike other languages, they're not reserved. So you can use them in your variable names, etc. Uh, but an, ex an exclamation mark in the end of a function name typically means that it has a side effect. So beware, a side effect will happen. In this case, we will print add one, two, and then we will return. So this happens before the, re the return value. <laughs> okay, now we're back, good. Um, and then, uh, so I can try this function, add one, exclamation mark two. First it will print, and then it will return three. So, nothing too strange there. Do we have any questions so far? Good. Higher order functions. Another functional concept. If you've done JavaScript, nothing strange about that. It basically means that functions are first class citizens. They can be an argument to another function. And they can also be the result of a function. One classic example of a function that has an argument that is a function is map. Uh, so map, the first argument to map is another function. And then the second is a sequence. And what map does, I think you're familiar with this as well, is that it applies this function to all the values of the sequence. So it returns a new sequence with 2, 3, 4 instead. And um, then you can, all, you can have more advanced things, like function returning functions. If you haven't done a lot of functional programming, this might be very strange. Uh, so the example is, we have a function add sum that takes an argument sum. And then it returns another function, fn stands for anonymous function, that takes an argument arg, and the result will be sum plus arg. So with this, I can create new functions. Def is not like that's just creating a var. In this case, the var will be another function, add two. That is a result of add sum and two. So add, this function add sum will return a function that will be bound to add two. Now we can use that, add two of three, and we get five. So, third functional paradigm concept, immutability. So, Closure was originally designed to, like from a Java background, if you program Java, you know, there's a lot of paradigms, a lot of best practices in Java uh, that you should do to make your code maintainable and handle concurrency in a good way. Um, yeah. um, so what Richicki, the creator of Closure, did is that he took all these that he thought the best, the best practices and he created a program language that kind of forces you to use these best practices. It's like you can do otherwise, but it's, it's not very fun. So if you like this way of programming, it's awesome. If you don't like it, you're going to have a bad time. One thing that he thinks is, and I agree, is very good for avoiding bugs is immutability. So, for, for, cause for example, and I hadn't noticed this before, before I, when I program immutable languages, I had never thought about this. But now, when I've been if, uh, programming an Im immutable language, when I go to an immutable language, I always get confused with, okay, for example, you have, a pro you have a, the value a of 
you have a variable or you have a property of an object or whatever that is called A, I never know what the value of A is. There's no guarantee what A will be because some other method might have modified it, some other person might have changed, like added a, like a, a setter to it in some other file, or maybe I did it a couple of weeks ago. There are other like computers over the network that could modify your data. You understand the concept that it's hard to keep track of what the value of a variable is, or at least personally. And this might not, when you're doing a small you know, app, this is, is easy. But if you're having, for example, a big React project, and you have components, 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 and this, and you don't like, then I have a problem like, okay, what is this actually scoped to? And I didn't write this code, so I don't know this, the setting. It's this on click, like, and this iterator. What is this? So it's, to me, using immutability simplifies things a lot and avoids, in my opinion, a lot of bugs. Of course, sometimes you need mutability because uh, immutability means that you can't change the value of a var. That is bad for a couple of reasons. For example, if performance. If you need super fast, if you're processing millions of things, then you need to update them in place because that will be faster rather than creating a new value all the time. So there are, and all, or, or for example, in React Redux, you have an app state, you have to update the state. The user must be able to change its name. Yeah. Um, so uh, you can change things in Clojure and Clojure Script, but then you have to be explicit about it. You have to say like, okay, this thing I'm gonna change sometime. And I'll show you how that is, how that is done later on. So in, in code examples, Define A here as one, and uh, nothing, no strange things there. And then, if I try to define A again, the compiler is like, uh, uh, and throw an error. Like you have, uh, this is, uh, yeah, A is already defined, and this is similar to const in JavaScript. But the thing is, there is nothing. There is no way to change the value of A. There are no operators in Clojure. There are, but they are never used. But typically, you you, you never change the value of A. A is always one. If you think that, no, actually, I need something else than one, I need two, for example, then you say, okay, you just define a new value that is a plus one, but this time it's called b. And if you think about it, typically, apart from when you're iterating through lists, a value should be, like, it should be, it's, it's normally, it is the same thing. If it is a new thing, then you should name it something else uh, to avoid confusion. For here, in, in the mutable land, I have A, and then, then I do this, and then I don't know what A is anymore. How, how, how many times someone has called this, I have no idea. If you have a debugger connected, sure. But if it's happening for a bug on the, for a user, you still don't know what A is. Um, and, but of course, this, is, this might be cumbersome if there were no ways to redeclare variables. What you can do is, within a scope, you can, you can create more vari variables. So using let, the function let, you can say that C should be one plus A, but it's only valid in this scope. So then you can use C, multiply it by three, and you get six. So you define B to be this, and you get B, that B is six. But if you try to access C outside, it will be undeclared. So this is very useful because a lot of the times you use the same things for variable names, ID, timestamp, etc. Yeah? Why is there a vector instead of, instead of a list for after the let? Because lists, if there, this would have been a list, then it would have been a value, then it would think that C is a function. So let takes a vector first, and then it takes the body after. So the, like the signature to let is first give me a vector and then give me some body. And in this vector you can declare, you can reassign variables. You can, you can, you can, like you can do pairs, you can do multiple, you can declare multiple. Because uh, every time the closure sees a vector like this, it will try to evaluate the first value in it. Um, Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Um, and also immutable data structures. So ClojureScript runs on in JavaScript, right? Um, the ClojureScript uses Clojure, uh, Java, JavaScript uh, numbers and strings and regexes, 
But since the the arrays and the objects are mutable in JavaScript, you can't do anything about that. They are. Then, and also to increase performance, Clojure and then also Clojure Script has implemented their own data structures that are immutable, so they can't be changed. Uh, and they, all, they also have the, the, this concept called keyword. That is a keyword is generally used instead of strings uh, in the program, because strings are only used when you're actually writing something to a user, or you have a sentence, you get a, like a, a JSON response that is not parsed yet. So strings are only f used for that. And then, for, other, for example, for keys in a map, you use keywords typically. You can use strings or other things if you want as well, but typically you use keywords for saying like this is something that is on, that is only pr in the program. It shouldn't see, it shouldn't reach the user in any way. It's just for keeping track of things in the program. A list, linked list, uh, implemented like this. You rarely use this because if I would try to, if I write it like this, it will try to evaluate one as a function. What you instead use is the vector uh, that I showed. So this is like a JavaScript array or any other vector implementation. You can access a, an element very quickly at, at, a, at a, certain, a certain point. Um, then something else that it has that is not very common is set. So if you have multiple values uh, of the same, it will, when you create a set out of that, it will only have one copy of each. And this is not something that you typically have in, your, in the average programming language, but it can be very useful in a, lot of, in a lot of ways when you want to guarantee that, okay, if I try to add this to the set, if it's already there, it won't change it. And this would also be very costly in a normal programming language because you have to compare all the time. But in Clojure Script, since it's immutable, then the, the values will always, like they will always point, they will always have the same pointer so that you can just compare like, okay, are these pointers the same? Yeah, okay, cool, it's the same value. I don't, I don't have to add it. Um, so comparisons, for example, are very fast in, uh, in immutable, with immutable data structures. And then the, perhaps the most used um, data structure is a hash map in Clojure Script. Here I use, I define a hash map as A1 or A, holds the value 1, B holds the value 2. Uh, and this um, yeah, you use a lot of times. You don't have to use keywords as keys in hash maps. You can also use numbers, strings, vectors, other hash maps as keys. So that's very useful when you want to be able to look up something based on something else. But typically, you use keywords. Um, OK, next chapter. Runtime data validation. So, my personal opinion after working with big front end apps is that it's a lot of data in your, for example, in your Redux store, in your app state, and cha you change it in a lot of strange ways. So, being able to validate that the data adheres to a data model can eliminate a lot of bugs and can be very, very nice. You can catch things earlier. Uh, Code script, however, is dynamically typed, just as JavaScript. So there's no static type checking. You don't, when the compiler won't check that, that you put an int in here and this function takes an int, so, oh no, this won't work. Uh, it, won't, it won't complain at all about that. Instead, the approach that Clojure has taken and Clojure Script as well, is to implement a very advanced runtime data validation. So instead of validating compile time, is this an int or a string? It does more validation because it validates it against a function instead. So you define a type in Clojure that are called a spec, and that and the instead of and that is not a primitive, that is just a function that you run against it. So you can do, for example, if you want to validate an email, you can check it against a regex to make sure this is a valid email. So you can do very advanced <coughs> type checks. So you can check that oh, I want a number, but it has to be an odd number between 1 and 100, for example. So you can, you can model your data to be very specific. I'll show you a little example of this. And uh, in this case, I have, we have a function called multiples of 3. It, uh, it takes a number, and then it takes modulo of, with 3 of that number, and then it checks if it's 0. 
So this will be true for 3, 9, 30, 90. It will be false for 10, for example, or 4. Then, as I said, we define a spec. And this, I didn't talk about this, but in Clojure you can use namespaces. So Clojure is name, Clojure script uses namespaces, which is super convenient. So you can just require a namespace instead of an actual file. So you never have to know, as long as the file is on the class path, like in Java, you can require it without having to know exactly where it is. Uh, so this is, name, this is the spec namespace. And it has a function called def. We, then we define mult of three. This, so this is the, the name of the spec that we will refer to later. And you say like, to, to do mult of three, check this function. Check the, use the mult of three function to check if it's a valid mult of three. Then we have our function, print multiples of three. Uh, it takes a number, and it'll, it'll print that number, multiple of three, and then the number. And this is dynamically typed, if you just write it like this, it will accept any value. It will print any value for you. But no, we wanted this to be multiples of 3. So what we can do then is to declare, say that, like specify this function, fdef, say that print multiples of 3, and this is just syntax, I don't want to look at that. What's important is here, mult of 3. So the argument should be a mult of 3 that we specified earlier. What it will happen, so what, what I've done here is in statically typed, you typically have them up at the signature, right? But since Clojure is not statically, it's dynamically typed, this is optional. And so there, therefore you can do it afterwards. Um, so if I now run multiples of 3 with 3, it will say, okay, cool, multiples of 3, 3. But if I try to do this with 4, it will throw an error. Because before the function is executed, this, the runtime will check, uh, is for a valid mult of 3, this function will return false, and it will not even run the function. And you think, obviously, okay, this sounds very expensive. You run a function before, before every function call? Yes, it is expensive. And therefore, we only do it in d during development. We don't do it in production. In production, we set a, fo a flag to false, and we re remove all these checks. And as it's shown during the three years that we've developed this and used spec, we have never had an error, or like we've had, yeah, we have had some errors, but very, very few errors that we hadn't caught in dev. Usually we catch all the errors in dev, and, uh, and, they, and then it's no problem to turn it off then in production. Uh, so that's been uh, very nice. Yeah, moving on. Yeah, yeah. No, we typically you write it like this. You have a function, then just underneath the function you define its, uh, the, the, the arguments to it. Uh, but the, it, the, the reason that it's not in the same here in the declaration is that, say that you're using another library, uh, <coughs> and, and, you want, and they haven't added any specs to their function, but you know that, oh no, this library, uh, it only takes integers, this function. Then you can spec using this. You can say like, oh, for this external library that is not my code, I still define it to only accept integers. So you can spec other people's code, uh, which is very nice. Um, so you can spec like JavaScript code that is not typed, but you can type it for them, kind of. Um, but and there are also people that have implemented so that you can write it straight up here normally. Yeah? Can you use multiple specs? What, what do you mean multiple? Like uh, for the function, you would say, Maybe multiple of three and then a multiple of uh, four. Totally. Yeah, yeah. You can, you can, you can. These are the reason that this looks very complex. Is it's a, it's a very, very advanced system. You can do a lot of like branchings and, yeah. It's you can do as much as you want. It's basically, uh, yeah. It's very, very advanced. Um, yeah. So this is replacement for tests, not types, right? Is this just tests? Do you write separate tests? Uh, regarding tests, so what, what you can do is, there's, there's a second argument to this that is called ret, that also checks the return value, that the return value is correct. And what you de then can do is you do generative tests. So 
the, there's a library, an official library, that will take and generate a thousand molts of three, input it here, and make sure that the return value always is, is always, always also conforms to the spec. And it will also make sure that it's, there's no errors. But we use this, and like it depends on what you mean as a replacement for types, we use this as documentation and as to check that we are, that our data is uh, correct. But it's not like, yeah. yeah. It's not it's just that you said so ClojureScript doesn't have types. Yeah. It has runtime data validation. Exactly. It's a replacement for types, but for tests. It's actually not a replacement, it's, it's tests. Specs are tests, right? If you write some tests, if you want to do TDD in ClojureScript, you just write separate some, some lines of the uh, specs and the return values and everything, and then you have just regular tests in JavaScript or everywhere else. Yeah, yeah, true, exactly. But there is also some kind of type system underneath, right? In the ClojureScript. Closure in general. And uh, no, or like in closure script, there's no underlying. Also, depends on how you define type system. There's no Is compiler there? that will check and make sure that the types are coherent, and you don't define so the types. Vectors and it checks function definition, so there has to be some kind of type. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry, this this does not happen in runtime. In in compiler, this happens in runtime yeah. when you run the code. Yeah, so I'm asking, uh, apart from this, is there something that's in Time. No, no, nothing in compile time. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, yes. In for macros, they they, they double check, they double. Uh, you can yeah check macros, but no, nothing in compile time in general. Uh, so this is only runtime. Yeah. And if you use this in production, you like have it in a separate file, or is there some uh, some method to turn it on? Yeah, no. There's you just you just there's a to get it going. You have to you have to run a function, and since it's a compiled language, we, we when we compile the production we use another entry file compared to the development. So we just don't call that enable spec check function and then it's fine. Uh, so we don't, yeah, it's very easy to just, just turn it off. Um, or like not enable it, so to say, yeah. So, so if I understand it correctly, the s slash def is defining the spec and the s slash f def is attaching it to, to the function? Exactly, so that's correct. You, can you do multiple s slash f defs for the same function or do you have to do one and then name everything in there? Uh, you do one, and then you use this instead of multiple three. Can be more com multiple three can be a combination spec of different different specs. So it can like include it's an and yeah. This it's all this this grammar for writing specs. Okay. Plus S -cat yeah. Means, uh, means, plus S cat means. means that it's a um, yeah. What is what is cat? So what it means is basically that orgs the arguments this should be a a sequence that has the first is will be named num and it should adhere to three and then you can keep on writing so cat is just like now I'm gonna validate a vector basically uh, yeah so this is um, uh, but yeah like all these intricacies of exactly how it works is a little confusing takes a little time getting used to because uh, it's very very powerful um, any more questions on there yeah what happens if you call the sfdef multiple times on the same function and then the, I think I'm pretty sure that the, just the last one of them will be correct. So you can override other people's specs. I'm pretty sure. I'm not 100 percent though. And can you get the other specs? So you want to add a new one? Yeah. Add, uh, yeah, exactly. You, there's there's a registry that you can access with current specs, and you can add, you can like combine them. Totally. Yeah. Uh, so if you if they have specified this with integer, and you want to say yeah, it's an integer, but also between one and hundred, you can combine that easily. Um, okay, uh, moving on to hosted language. Um, so, one big problem if you're going to create a new program language and you're not Google or Facebook, or two big problems, is that there will be zero libraries. How, how are you going to access Postgres? Uh, there will be no performance optimizations. Your code will be just working in the beginning, and so it will be slower than it could be. So what Rich Hickey did, the creator of Clojure, is that he's like, oh, I'm going to take advantage of the, at the time, most optimized and best library platform, which was the JVM. So Clojure was developed to be sit on top of the JVM, compiled to Java bytecode. Uh, so and the good thing about that is, then you have all the Java libraries out of the box. You can already access the JDBC, you can access Postgres straight away. That's fine. And you can also take advantage of all the like 30 years of performance optimizations that the JVM has had. So you can get, you get both speed 
and you can get all the libraries out of the box. And you can even use it like people don't even have to know that you're writing closure code because it'll just compile to a jar and you can just run it. Uh, it's also easy for like deployment and those kinds of things. Same thing for ClojureScript, but for JavaScript. Uh, we can use the libraries from NPM, and we can use all the, the um, V8 optimizations. Super nice. And then we all obviously also get the reach of JavaScript. The web, React Native, Node.js. There's probably, like given this speed, it'll probably be a, an OS in JavaScript soon as well. Um, yeah, um, so uh, ClojureScript is heavily, like it's very focused on very good interoperability with JavaScript. Because we understand that not everyone writes ClojureScript. You have to be able to use normal JavaScript as well. So, uh, ClojureScript functions are just JavaScript functions. So, and this vice versa. So, using this namespace, JS, you can just access the power2 function straight away from JavaScript and use 2 to the power of 3, you get 8 back. Super easy. Um, and you can also, um, I said that ClojureScript has its own data structures, immutable ones, but you can work with native JavaScript data structures as well, if you want. For example, uh, if you have a, in the scope, there is a, a, a vector or an array called A, then you can, JS slash A, you will get the value back of A. And this little thing means that this is a JavaScript array, not a closure array, a vector. And then you can work with it to get the value of A. Uh, like, okay, I want the, or for example, the, the, the index one of A. I use the A get, and you get, uh, the, you get B. And this might be a little clunky compared to like, um, uh, like the, the brackets that you use in JavaScript, but you don't use too much of this. this not, you don't use JavaScript vectors or like uh, data structures too much. So when you use them, it's fine. Um, and what you typically do is if you get a lot of JavaScript data in, you convert it to ClojureScript data structures just using this uh, little neat function. So JavaScript to CLJ, and boom, you get a ClojureScript vector instead of the JavaScript array. Uh, so then, and then you can use all the ClojureScript map, reduce, all those functions. Okay, uh, the last thing before the uh, the coding, um, the REPL. Uh, so the REPL stands for Read, Evaluate, Print Loop. And it's a shell that you typically do two things with. Either you quickly evaluate code and get the instant result. How does, like, is one plus one, or what is one plus one? Uh, and you can get the, the feedback instantly. But the more advanced thing is that you can connect to a running JavaScript environment. So for example, if you're developing for the web, you can connect to Chrome and then inspect the current state of, of your application. So this is, sounds a little funky and weird, and I'll show this uh, soon. Um, first, though, yeah, we can do a little live coding. See how this goes. Um, okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the REPL, and um, this is a, a um, I'm using a program called Plank that you can just install on your Mac. Brew install Plank, and then it'll install this little tool for you. And what it'll do is it'll just open a REPL uh, straight away in the terminal. Uh, you can also use the REPL from your favorite IDE, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But just for, for ease here, I'll show you how, how you can do it in the REPL. And you can validate what I was saying before. Good, looks good. Uh, can define vars. And then I can say, oh, A, A is one, good, A one. Cool. I can also define functions. Add one. And there you see that it's a little ind indented, right? It's not there, it's here. So you might be confused by all these parentheses. It looks weird, it's very like, it takes a while to get used to. One thing that helps a lot is that all your editor, all your editors will have support for uh, like automatically indenting the code so that you see, okay, this parenthesis. Otherwise, if you have five parentheses, 
it'll be impossible to know like should I close this parenthesis where am I uh, but it, it does this for you so there's very little like parenthesis confusion um, at least after a while um, so I'll, I'll do this function and you see there that it like it auto completed it showed me when I do this that okay now you close this parenthesis so I know that two was enough um, in the remaining parentheses? And that is a feature I'm not aware of. It, it would be nice. Uh, but yeah, no, typically you have to close them up yourself. But in general, all the, all the editors, if you open a parenthesis, you'll automatically, they'll automatically close it, like add, add a closing parenthesis for you. Uh, okay, so now we have add one. You can use that function. Cool, seems to work as well. Uh, I will show you, uh, And um, no, closing that, closing that. Now I define a hash map, um, and then if I want to get, so one neat thing with keywords, for example, is that there are also functions. So you remember, if I have the first word, uh, the first thing in, in the list is the function. If I call, if I use a keyword as a function on a hash map, I get the value back which is super useful when you're like threading through and you're like d diving into data. Like I've never worked with a program language that is so easy to get into as, um, or like work with data structures. Uh, I'm gonna show you, uh, like we'll say that we have this super nested data structure. Um, um, So what I could do, there's a couple of ways of accessing. If I want to get to three, I could do uh, get m2, one, and then do that again, like nest, and then do like, uh, and, oh no, sorry, wrong. And like keep on going. Um, and but I could also do that was that was a little that's a little nicer. I can do one. Sorry, let's see this. Two, one, and two. Prettier. Uh, and then I can add three at the end. But closure also has a threading macro that will do this automatically for you. So we'll say like okay, to M two apply the function. 1, then apply the function 2, then apply the function 3. I'll just get the value. So you can just very easily, and say that, say we have M3, where uh, hello is actually, a, there is actually a vector there, then this will return, oh, oh yeah, sorry, M3. And then it's like, okay, a vector, unfortunately, I can't, I can't get out of a vector automatically because the, the number zero is not a um, value. But what I can do, though, is this. Or like, I can do elf is more idiomatic. And I can get, so like, you can thread, the first value will continue to thread along. Uh, so it will create, like, your code will become very elegant and like, working with data structure is super, super simple. Uh, and very straightforward, it's very clear to see what's happening. Um, okay, getting back. Um, so, um, even though you might be a little confused and put off by all these parentheses, um, you might still feel that, like, okay, this old thing, if you learn a new program language, you'll be a better programmer. I can guarantee if you work, if you try Clojure Script, you might, you might not do it on your day job, but you'll definitely become a better programmer because it's a very different take on programming in a lot of ways. So say that you want to try it out, uh, then I'll talk a little about how you can get started. So first, you gotta pick your target platform. So Clojure Script compiles to JavaScript, but JavaScript can be used in a million different contexts. Uh, the ones that are Clojure Script currently has tooling for is the web, very good tooling, Node.js, it works, but there's like, if you're doing production apps in Node.js, it might be a little wonky. React Native, that's what we're doing, but it's um, yeah, pretty advanced. Uh, if you've never done React Native nor Clojure Script, 
doing React Native and CloseScript is going to be hard. Uh, just being honest here. <laughs> it's awesome, but it's very hard. Uh, okay, so say that you want to do web and Node.js, or do or no, or no, or no, or yes, JS. In JavaScript, you have Webpack, Babel, Ugly Fires, etc., etc. Uh, and they can be different versions. You might get conflicts. The good thing about CloseScript is we only have like you have these four tools, but you only use one of them. You don't use all of them. For example, the most popular one is Figwheel. So Figwheel is hot code reloading, REPL, comp compilation, and production uh, code. So it does everything for you. If you have Figwheel, you don't need anything else. You need to upload your files to AWS or whatever. But other than that, like it's all it's all solved for you. Uh, so I recommend Figwheel if you're doing Greenfield Project Closure Script. That is then that's the only thing you need. Figwheel. Um, it uses it's based on another tool called Lining In, but that you only have to like brew install Lining In, and then you can run Figwheel. Um, another one is Boot CLJS. It's I'm sorry. The popularity here is how many star how many uses they have on uh, on GitHub. So Figwheel is used in 8,200 repos, public repos on GitHub. Boot CLJ is a little less. Boot CLJ is very flexible and advanced. Don't use this if you're starting out. It's super complicated. Uh, very advanced, but very complicated. Uh, Shadow CLJS is a new thing that is just a more little less than a year old, so it's it's not very popular yet. It's not very used. But it's well, the, the interesting take is it's very focused on NPM. So when Clojure Script came out, NPM and Webpack wasn't even a thing. So support has been added to Figwheel, but it's not first it, like it's it's not works as good as it could have. So Shadow CLJS is a new take. And for example, if you're doing a if you want to try out Clojure Script, you have a React app, and you want to like just make this one component in Clojure Script. Then what Shadow CLJS can do for you is like you can write this one component in Clojure Script in React, in Clojure Script React, and then just compile that component to a JavaScript module that you can then import from your other ES6 JavaScript or TypeScript or whatever. So you can just use it at any other any other module. So that's very very interesting. Um, and it has all the features of Figwheel as well, but it's not as user friendly and polished. Um, then there's also the Depths Eden, which is like the super minimalistic solution. It's also very new. There's no real point in using that. It's also uh, not yeah. It's it's not user friendly enough if you're starting out. Then uh, React Native. If you're using React Native, uh, there's two ways of using React Native. It's the I want to write native code, Java or Objective C. Then you use a tool set called Renatal. Or if you're using Expo, that is like the JavaScript only version of React Native, uh, which I recommend. If you don't need to do native stuff, then do Expo. I think it's nicer. No, oh, okay. Um, I didn't agree on that, but. Uh, And these both use Figwheel under the hood. But in general, tooling in React Native is not very polished. And there's a great Slack community in Clojure and Clojure Script, so you get a lot of help. But it's like, it'll, it's confusing from the beginning. You have to know what you're doing, uh, unfortunately. Um, and then, editor. So, like all editors have syntax highlighting. That's not what editor support means for Clojure Script. What you want as well is. You want the REPL that, that I talked about before. So you can, instead of doing it in the terminal, you can do it in your editor, straight away from your editor, with all your uh, like key bindings and stuff and like syntax highlighting. And what also, I didn't write it here, and also another very important feature is uh, the paredit or the, like these parentheses. Like there's, so there's basically a lot of key bindings for editing code with parentheses, which go all the way back to the Lisp days like in the 70s or 50s or whatever. But it's so that, that can make you very, like, since it's all data structured, you can, there's a form of m like modifying them from your keyboard, which is it's pretty cool. But you have to kind of try it out to understand it. Uh, the editors that exist are, the most popular is IntelliJ, and the, it's called Cursive. And then, of course, Lisp, it's Emacs, is also very popular. And then the Clojure plugin is called Cider. A lot of people use Vim. It's called Fireplace. 
And there's also recently uh, more targeted toward JavaScript is the Atom editor with ProtoRepl. The cool thing about IntelliJ is that it'll do fairly advanced like linting in the it'll show you like oh this is is this var is glo is never used for example or this var is on you you're trying to access a var that is not declared yet so you can do pretty like in my experience more advanced than javascript like understanding of the code uh, which is very nice so you can see oh i don't i never or like i misspelled this for example or autocomplete etc etc um yeah, and then ultimately frameworks. So first, I want to say that ClojureScript had like it was tough for ClojureScript coming out because it was not sure how to work with the DOM. But ClojureScript community was super lucky that React came out. And if you think about it, React is also very functional, just as ClojureScript. You have a state, the props or your Redux store, and then you have the React component that is a function that generates HTML to the DOM. So this, like, this is very functional compared to Angular when you have like, data bindings uh, going back and forth. It's just state, component, HTML. And this works perfectly, beautifully in ClojureScript. It works, it works so well that the first re wrappers, Regent, came out just like when, re when React, I don't know how long ago it was, like probably like three, yeah, three or four years ago, and it basically hasn't changed the syntax or anything since then. It just works. Perfect. So that's, uh, we haven't, yeah, it's more than three. It must be like five years ago or something almost. Uh, and we're, and then, so if you want to do something super minimal, I'll show you Regent soon. It's like very basic. And if you want to do something like a bigger app, then you can use Reframe, which is similar to Redux. It came out actually, I think before, it has a lot of um, um, inspiration from Elm. If you know Elm, they're very similar in like the like the old reactive way of thinking. Um, it's similar to Redux, but a lot less boilerplate and like simpler in a way. We had a a guy uh, on our team coming in from the back end. He had only done closure back end work, no front end. He knew what React was, but he he never touched front end. And he was able to ship production code within a week. Like he'd done this whole mobile screen that he had developed, he understood everything, I never had to even, like I told him once or twice how things were working, but he just picked it up because he was so intuitive and he understood it and he could just like, uh, like just deploy the, the code to production, it was pretty awesome. So Reframe is very nice. Um, then, although you, you might like the new trendy GraphQL Relay Falcor kind of a setup, if you're more into that, then on next. Is, the, um, is that equivalent in Clojure Script land. Uh, and then you, there's an, another one called Hoplon. I don't have any experience with that. Uh, and then there's also RUM, which is a minimal React wrapper. Uh, one cool thing about RUM is if you want to do server-side rendering, RUM is actually, has actually implemented React on the JVM. So you can render your components on the JVM and then send them over to your front end. And it's not just the HTML, it's actually all the React IDs and tags and whatever. Uh, so that's very advanced. Um, but I, my recommendation is either re Reframe or Omnext. Or Omnext is a little more, it's not as user friendly, uh, probably. Um, yeah? Do you usually use the Reframe thing with Om together? Or does no. Om also manage state and? Om manages everything. It's exactly. So these are. All these are separate. The difference is Regent is included in Reframe, but you can you use this technically or generally use this separately. Yeah. And also, if you heard about DataScript, the uh, in, immutable database in browser database, it's by the creator of RUM, so it works very nicely with RUM, and if you get data from there. Uh, but yeah, typically use this instead of Redux. Use this instead of Relay. This is a completely different take. And then Regent is just minimal React wrapper. More questions on that? Yeah? Can I use React without the wrapper? Or any other yeah, you can. You can use it without wrappers, totally. Like React is just, there's just the create class or create element functions that you can use if you want, but I've never heard of anyone doing it. But you can use all the JavaScript stuff straight from ClojureScript if you want. It's easy, but these, these wrappers, I'm going to show you why it's so, why it's so nice. Uh, actually, I'm going to show you straight away. Um, so here is a um, what I've done now. I told you before that there are two. There's you have the lining in, 
uh, line, uh, which is the um, the tool that like starts things up. So you have to brew install that, and then when you, as soon as you brew installed lining, and you can do line new fig fig wheel, for example, uh, and then. Uh, and then it'll just scaffold the project for you. It's kind of like Create React App or Yeoman or something different. So I've already done that. And this is how the, the, the directory looks. It looks a little weird because I'm... The screen is weird. Um, so what the only thing I have to do then, after scaffolding this uh, app, is... Um, I can show you the readme. So we'll just say, like, just run line fig wheel to get, get going. Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll run line fig wheel. So as I said before, fig wheel will do cutting fruit, weirdly enough. <laughs> but it'll do like hot code reloading, the rep ball, everything for you. Um, and so it validates my, my config, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to use that. I'm going to just use this for now. So now I've got a... Uh, I'm connected now to the um, uh, to the um, yeah to this browser. Yeah. So first, I'm going to show you how like okay, um, just like in React, we have all these standard like hot code reloading, for example. So first, this is a can I erase this somehow? Um, so this is the whole my whole the, the, all everything that you're seeing here, basically. So in Clojure Script. Regent, then all React components. So instead of JSX, we just have data structures. In Clojure Script, we like data. We try to keep things data as much as possible instead of classes or functions. Because data you can inspect, data you can modify very easily. So this vector here uh, contains a, a keyword called div, which means that the, the outer component should be a div. Inside that, we have an h1 that gets the key text from the app state. Think your Redux store, for example. And then we have an H3 with the text subtitle. And then in the end, we have a line chart, which is another function that is admittedly a little more complex. Uh, but it's just because I've been doing this hackily. And it just it looks very strange. Like this, it should look. Uh, so it looks a little cleaner. You're super confused still, because it's a lot of parentheses and keywords and stuff. Uh, but it's it's not as complicated as it seems. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that FigWheel is actually as good as, as anything else. So we can uh, we can do some. And then I save this, and it'll be oh, yeah, it'll update the text here as normal hot code reloading. Uh, and then um, yeah, I think that's the only thing I'm going to do there, actually. What I've done in this app is I've just done a GET request to a little JSON weather, that I've, weather data that I've downloaded, and then I've just plotted it. Uh, but I'm going to show you now. It gets a little more interesting. Um, so now I'm connected with the REPL uh, to Chrome. You might not believe me, uh, but then... So I do this. Uh, JS alert. My alert. Hello, and uh, boom. So I've just executed that code on in Chrome. Um, I'm going to stop Firefox also. <laughs> it was also connected here. Um, and uh, so I executed both in Firefox and Chrome. Uh, so now we're only one connection. Um, but what I want to do now is I want to inspect my actual app. That is the, the actual value of it. So when I started the app, so here, another thing I'm going to tell you about is I told you about how mutable state, you have to be explicit when you want to do mutable state. In this case, the app state has to be mutable, right? You have to have new data coming in. So you have, must be able to change this reference. So then I've wrapped my hash map in Atom, which means like, okay, this is now a mutable thing that you can use for mutable state. Uh, and then also, if I want to, as I said, it's the... Um, it's it's a no. Uh, yeah. So um, now I I I entered this namespace. I'll say at the the top here. 
uh, CLJ's demo core. So I can go to this, this namespace straight away. And uh, what I can do then is to see you have a, a defined here already. Then I can just get A. Okay, it's one. Cool. But what I can also do is I can get the app state. Uh, I do this little at symbol, which means for this mutable thing, it might change in the future. Give me the value right now. The value of this mutable thing right now. So I put the app before and I'll say, like, okay, give, it, give it to me now. And it'll just return the whole app state. You saw the original app state was the text. But then I also, with a, with a, um, a get request, I fetched some data. And um, the good, like, I can, what I can do is I can, if I want to update this state, I can just change the initial state, right? Uh, uh, and I can, yeah, I can update it. So it will be updated. But I can't change this data from the beginning. So say that you're working with this and you want to see, like, okay, how does this behave if the app state is different? If I add, if I add a really long username, if I do something different. For example, let's see what happens to this graph if the, te the first temperature was really, really high. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to do swap, which means for the app state, mu mutate it. So it's like, okay, mutate it with this function. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to soak in, which is basically if you have a data structure, go into the data structure and update a value. So I'm going to soak in the app state. First, I'm going to go for data. And then say that I'm going to go for the first, the first uh, value of the data, the first uh, index 1. And then I want to change the temperature. Temperature. No, that is not the, what the key I was looking for. Uh, so say that we want to change the temperature to 25 instead. Boom. Then you see that this will update in real time. Now the temperature is up to 25. What if I had an extreme case of 125? Okay, this is how the graph will look. Ah, actually I'm more interested in the 25 one. That's more interesting. I changed that. So you can like in real time you can update your, your application state. And why is this so valuable? Because if you like typically, when you're doing a demo, if, you, if someone is doing a demo, hot code reloading for React, everything is super fast, and there's like, no, you don't see any like glitches or anything. But if you worked on a bigger project, you know that hot code reloading doesn't always work, and it doesn't, it's not always fast. It'll take a while. Like you're, you're, and, and as soon as hot code reloading breaks, maybe no one fixes it, so you, you go back to reloading the page, the whole page sometimes. I worked in those kinds of projects. Uh, and then all of a sudden you have to compile everything, takes a couple of seconds, and then you reload the page, the app has to load, then you have like a 10 second turnaround time for just changing like a little value, you know what I mean? If you're doing some like layout, you just want like, oh, I just want the padding 12 instead, and it'll just have to, or like, I just want to change this value. And sure, there are tools like Re React Inspector, but they're not as, maybe they're, they won't do exactly what you want. So here you can modify your environment and this doesn't matter how big my app is. Like I can have a, the biggest app in the world, and this will still be instant, because only the code that I'm writing here is sent to the browse, browser. Only this little code, so it'll always be instant. I can always like, inspect the values of... Um, I can show you, for example, if I have the app state... Uh, yeah, no, I think actually I'm running a little long time now. Go back to the um, uh, to this to, to the presentation. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. So since you said that uh, you know the tags, the HTML tags are also data. Yeah. You can you can change various subtrees in HTML DOM. Yeah. To reload all the time. Yeah. Anytime, not just the state, but everything else, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. I'll, like exactly, I can show you that quickly. Like, so if I have this here. I can add, this is just a data structure, so I can just add another, like, you just add another um, beginning span, for example, and it'll just update. And I can also, like, update that through, like, all, all these other functions that work on data, like ASOC and, like, like, CONJ, all those, like, kinds of data 
so like yeah you can you can you can work with your components as data which is super powerful um, okay back to the presentation um, so Clojure script versus JavaScript um, the things that Clojure script has immutability not everyone might like it I think it's super useful and then we also have the REPL as I just showed and another thing that is very nice with Clojure Script is that you have to share code on the, you can share code with Clojure on the JVM. In our case, we have a backend that is Clojure and a frontend that is Clojure Script. So even though the backend runs on the JVM, we have written our data validation in a, with an extension that is CLJC, which means that it compiles to Clojure Script and also to Clojure. So we validate our data client side with uh, Clojure script, make sure the data is fine. We send it to the, to, the, to the server and it will also validate it using the exact same functions. So this is very powerful. You can use the same functions both on the back end and on the front end. Yeah? But here in the comparison you mean plain JavaScript. Exactly, totally, exactly. This is compared to plain JavaScript, exactly. There, there, there's obviously a lot of other cases. Uh, uh, like ES, ES6 is a lot of a lot of people like I've worked in a lot of projects when people use mostly only yeah, only ES6. Uh, but yeah, no, totally. People like TypeScript and Flow. They are uh, they're extremely popular as well. Um, so a closure also has this. Closure script also has this uh, immutable data structures that can make your app a little faster, um, depending. Uh, and it also has this first class support for data validation. And this is not only for typing your own code. Obviously, data validation can be used as well if you have an incoming JSON data. Do you want to make sure that what you're getting is correct from this API that you're calling? They want to see, okay, this is actually good data. Uh, you can also use it for that. Uh, props, uh, pros with JavaScript is that it's, all, it's obviously the default. All tutorials, all the tools, everything is just made for JavaScript in the beginning. And then all the other languages have to adapt to that kind of. Uh, so you get it faster. And, and then also JavaScript, you can combine functional programming with object-oriented programming. You can have a class, but you can also have higher order functions. So if you want to combine it, then that works. Closure script also has um, like uh, polymorphism constructs, but um, I, they're kind of advanced. You don't use them super often, uh, so I didn't go into that uh, during this presentation. JavaScript obviously also has better tooling support in the, in the case that there are more people like working on the tools. On the other hand, like I guess a lot of people, I, I have filed some issues in big tools and no one ever looks at them. If you file an issue in a, Java, in a Clojure script tool, it's a much higher probability that someone will respond to it because uh, it's like a smaller community. Um, and so if you, if you, like me, if you, if you just try out Clojure script, uh, even though you don't, you won't do anything with it again. You're just like, okay, this is a nice experience, but not my cup of tea. Uh, you'll still learn something from it. And one one way, of what I've learned, and what I usually do is now I write my JavaScript a little more closure scripty. Uh, what that would mean is the following. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, exactly. So strive for functional code. I try to avoid this as much as possible and just have functions that are just, they don't depend on any other state. They're completely pure functions, they have a, uh, like, so, so not, not much this, because this always confuses me. Did I, did I remember to bind it? What is this referring to now? And I don't feel that I need it, actually. I never miss it. Um, and when, when you're using React, I try to use stateless components as much as possible. Because a problem is, if I, if I have Redux, but at the same time I put a lot of state in my components, then the state will not, that will not be saved to local storage if you have, if you save your Redux to local storage, for example. So if you reload the page, all the setup that you had will be lost. And it will be, so then you have to re-click on all these things and open this model again, all that stuff. There's no point in having local state in React unless, for some, for some reasons it is, but you can use it way less than you think, actually. Uh, and try, so I try to put all my state in Redux. Um, it's harder because readers, like it's not, it, uh, people know that it's a, a bit verbose, but you, you can still do it. Also, uh, the engineers at Facebook thought that, oh, Clojure and Scala with immutable data structures, it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, but we don't want to change the Clojure to Scala, uh, but 
but we uh, we still want this. So they implement they they launched this library called Immutable JS that has data structures that are very similar to closure data structures. So if you use Immutable JS, you get similar similar data structures from that. Yeah. And then you can then I try to use pure and transparently referential functions. Transparently referential means that I can like I can switch it out from one like I can replace the function with another function and like no one ha it, it's not referencing a lot of other stuff so I can just like switch it out uh, very easily so to do that I minimize the side effects like no like I don't write to other variables like if, if a variable should be updated it has to be an input argument as I said before the pure functions I only work with input arguments and I only return a value or like in general sometimes obviously I have to write to a database or do something then of course I do that but I like limit the side effects as much as possible uh, and I, I personally I feel that this it might be a little getting used to in the beginning if you come especially if you have like a C background this is not the, the way to do it generally um, but it's actually very very useful um, so an example a concrete example of like if you have the like imperative object oriented not necessarily object, but like imperative style you have a var, then you create a function without an input argument that references i, and this is not pure because i is defined out here. This function can only be run in the scope where i is defined. And then you do inc, and then you do i. You don't know how many times inc have been run, like is inc referenced from somewhere else, so you don't really know what the value of i is. Instead, in closure script, uh, when you define the function, you give it a, an input argument, i, and then you should return the new value. And then you have a const, and then if you want, like, okay, I want this to be a new value, you define a new const when you apply the function. And sure, like, this is not as performant, but, like, frankly, if this is your performance uh, issues, then you're very good at writing algorithms already. So uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that performance loss. Uh, V8 will worry about that for you. Um, yeah, I think that was it, actually. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah? Uh, not sure if I understood. When you were defining your functions, uh, arguments uh, that you define the vector, and you name it, for example, r, is that a single... Uh, Parameter, or yeah. Is it, or, it, or it corresponds to as many as I want. To. No, no. You, you, um, you can have uh, like this. Then you have multiple arguments. Okay. So I have to explicitly define the arguments. Yeah, exactly. There is no correspondence to, for example, the spread that there is oh, in yeah. JavaScript. Oh yeah. Totally. There's the structuring. It's very, it's very common. You use that a lot. So if if it is a if the argument is a vector. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, so let's do that then. Uh, so in the REPL also, I can overwrite things. Uh, so if, the, if, it is a, if it is a vector, for example, R1, R2, then I can do add to, and I can pass it a vector. And this thing will destructure one to arg one and two to arg two. And you can do the so like here, normally I do it like this, but since I've put a vector around it, it knows to destructure the incoming data. So one is arg one. So you see this this is the vector that is actually this vector. Mm -hmm. So it's it does the you can do the exact same things uh, as in as in JavaScript. The difference is when you're using the spread operator in, in JS, like this, you're copying data all the time, back and forth, and that becomes costly if you have big state to copy all the time. But in, in Clojure Script, you're just, re, you're just referencing it, you're just copying the reference instead of the whole data. And will this uh, technique like, help me out? Like, there is one important uh, pattern React apps, which is higher order components that pretty much depend on the spread operator of uh, Props. Is it possible to use this? Yeah, totally, um, totally. Yeah, yeah. You you can you can pass a you can pass also a um, a hash map, for example, oh. and you can destructure, um, like you can destructure a. Then you use a different 
Um, so this 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 now will just no that was oh yeah I forgot the. Um, so now I can. No, sorry, R one one, R two two. And it will like pick out the keys, and I can also. In this definition, I can name this value as map. No, well, not map because it's a function. And I can actually okay, so I return this instead. I won't do anything. Then add to will just return that map that I referenced. Yeah, so I named it like yeah, the map, the, the whole map, and I can also destructure the arguments. That's different from JavaScript, where you either get the arguments and the rest, but here you can also get the get the map. Yeah. Other other questions? In the definition of map in your slides, you are passing in a vector and you are getting out the list. Yeah. This is kind of confusing because the semantics of, of map is usually you get a list and you get a list out. You know, you're, you're getting out the same type of thing. Oh, yeah, exactly. So that is one thing that I haven't talked about. So exactly, if you, if you do map, to, for example, ink, which is add one, Exactly. You have you have an input vector. You get a you get a, a, a list out. The reason is that map is lazy. So when when you do map ink, it will only save it will only like save this um, as a as a as a, it will it will not run ink on everything. It will just save like okay like as a statement. So it's basically a lazy sequence. It's called. I don't know if you're familiar with lazy data structures. So it's it, it closure. All the data structures are lazy. So they're not until I get the value. That's when I evaluate the code. So it won't be evaluated straight away here. Because so if I do, for example, this. If I define um, b to be this, nothing will be done until I use b. Then it will calculate. So between here, here is when we'll calculate this actual thing. And this, this just denotes that if it is a sequence like this, it's, it's lazy. But I can also do map v, then it will, it will actually run through everything and return the actual value. Uh, yeah, like a, an example, for example, is if I do print ln, you know, the function, one, two. Oh, yeah, exactly. Now I, if I do this, uh, def def c it didn't print anything but if i when i reference it that's when it evaluates it okay, and how, how does it relate to the vector versus list uh, so the list is lazy and the vector is evaluated straight away if i do this map v then it will return a a uh, a vector and then it will evaluate it straight away okay. do you understand the difference uh, so vectors are always evaluated straight away, but uh, when you but typically the sequences are lazy, so they're not evaluated because maybe I don't need like maybe I don't need all the values from map. Maybe I just want the first value. Then when I access the first value, that's when that value will be computed. So you can get a lot of like performance when you're dealing with big data sequences. You can do a lot of performance. You can get like a lot of performance benefits out of that. And you can also do this function, for example, a function range that will do that, but if I just run range without an argument, it will crash because it's an infinite sequence. So I have to crash. So I have to stop it. Now everything died. Uh, so like you, you have to know what you're doing with infinite sequences. Um, other questions? Yeah. What the databases do you use? Uh, connectors. Yeah, the, you, as, you said, as I said, we're using Clojure on the back end, so you can use JDPC, so you can use all the databases. So we're, just in, we're using Postgres. There is a Clojure error database from the same company that developed Clojure that's called Datomic, uh, that some people use in the Clojure community, but Postgres works just fine as well. Yeah? How does it look uh, styling those components, like do you pass a hash map to? Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll show you. Let's see. Like, I can imagine probably basic. Oh, it's a bit of an issue, but uh, is there like something more advanced that you can use instead of that? Or so, what. 
you you just use like for as like you can use just the same um, uh, the same way you use it like in um, in like in, in JavaScript. So here I pass pass a hash map that is with the options style. I set the color to red. Font family consolas. Yeah. So like I, I can do that, but I can also use all the other JavaScript CSS modules, whatever you want to use. They're also compatible with Clojure Script. So you can you can use normal CSS. So everything is that whatever you want to use is available to you in um, uh, in Clojure as well. In React Native, we use the inline styling. And if they get too big, do you move them? Oh yeah, exactly. Style? I can do exactly. I can do I can do this, and then I can just. Uh, um, do that instead, and just so that's just up to you, like how you want how you want to do that. Uh, so that's there's no restriction. Like generally in Clojure Script, there's no restrictions on how you want to do things. If you want to do it like, like there's, you you can do everything. It for like it, it pushes you to use immutability and those kinds of things, but it's not that oh you can't use CSS modules because of something. Yeah. So because it, it's very interoperability is important. Any other? Yeah. Uh, do you think of a reframe, change your approach to handling of side effects in Red Hat stuff? Yeah, like, uh, definitely, like the reframe is very like when you're using side effects. So a reframe works, it's like a dispatch event. It dispatches to a function that returns an update of the, of the state. And so it also, or like it actually returns a hash map. And in that hash map, you can define one key that is like, oh, run this side effect, the register side effect. So it's like, it definitely, uh, like typically, it, it, it like also like pushes you to think, like to be explicit about side effects, and also only return data in general from the from the reframe handlers. Uh, so it becomes still pure. But then you have something else looking at. Okay, you added the key HTTP request, then I'll take that and I'll do an HTTP request for you. Yeah, so basically use middlewares, uh, then some sagas or tank or something like this? Uh, yeah, exactly. I, uh, I, like I've, when I've done Redux, I've never, yeah, I, I never know the, the words of, because uh, I'm just thinking about uh, re, uh, reframe. So, uh, but basically, uh, yeah, exactly. No, sorry, I don't, I'm like, I'm too unfamiliar with the exact nomenclature to know what, where, in which stage of the, yeah. Of the, of the Redux, but like it basically just you, the difference with reframe is it's just data that is flowing through all the time uh, instead of instead of functions or things like that. Um, yeah, but yeah, I'm sorry, I can't can't explain that better. Yeah. So these side effects in reframe are your thing, or is everybody who uses reframe does it like this? And there's a no. You 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 can choose like so. Basically, in reframe, you can choose like how you want to apply. Uh, if you want to register these special, so when you get a return value, uh, or like when when you when you dispatch the, the registering of the handlers, is it a reframe thing? Or yeah, it, yeah, it's a reframe thing. It's a reframe thing. But you don't have to make them pure if you don't want. You you can do as I said, it's pragmatic. So you can just do side effects in them if you want. But like, there's also a tool for making them uh, explicit. Other questions? Yeah. How did you start using code script in your, your company? Like, did you have some old application written something else? Uh, no, so I, so I uh, worked at another startup before where we were trying out different, uh, different tech stacks, Ruby, Clojure, JavaScript, Node, and we, we decided, like, okay, Clojure Clojure Script seems very bleeding edge and, like, not too big community, but we like it, so let's give it a try. We gave it a shot, and we really liked it. So then when I... And uh, when I like co-founded the other company, I said like, okay, let's do. Uh, I know enough Clojure Script, so I know that I'm I'm more productive and I write better code in Clojure Script than in JavaScript, and I want to do React Native, so we'll do Clojure Script. And um, yeah, so it's basically uh, like in this news company, I decided that we should do it in Clojure Script because I was familiar enough with it. And how difficult is it to find programmers? It's not so. What we're doing is we're not recruiting closure closure script programmers necessarily. We're recruiting programmers that are willing to learn functional programming. You know what I mean? So it's because uh, you can learn it pretty fast. Like if you're 
if you're like if you've done some programming before and if you're open to new things, uh, like it's basically, so it only has to be that you want to learn Clojure script. Uh, so it's not like you have to know it before you start working at Piloxa. Uh, so like we will teach you on the way. We're more looking for like smart programmers rather than Clojure script experts because that will be that's harder to find. <laughs> but it's but it's no no big uh, no big problem as long as you the person can get used to the parentheses, which almost everyone does. Other questions? So what was the tool you used before the Clojure script? Uh, so we tried out, oh, like the, when we were testing it out, we were testing out like Rails, like Node.js, like Express, and uh, like normal plain React. But this, when I started with Clojure script, Redux hadn't even come out yet. It was still Flux, I think, and Flux was just so like there were no real like the, the whole Redux community didn't, didn't. So then I've been working on another project with Redux, uh, like between like between my my two companies, um, but uh, we basically just needed vanilla React at the time, so we didn't we didn't evaluate Re Redux because it didn't didn't exist. Cool, awesome, the T-shirt. Uh, I think I might go for um, quantity this time, and uh, Sir over here, I think, asked a lot of questions. You're welcome. So thank you guys for, for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Peter, for everything, and now you can enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> nice.